gotten pretty popular to discuss masculine and feminine energy. Boundaries has come under attack recently as something masculine. Thank you so much for joining me today on Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience and a narcissistic abuse survivor. In this episode, we're going to define what is a personal boundary and what makes a boundary healthy or unhealthy. We'll also, at the end, touch on cheating and why it happens in narcissistic as well as non-narcissistic relationships. I am so thrilled you're here with me today. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss future episodes and leave a review and let me know what you think of the show. Finally, thank you so much for your contributions to this listener-supported podcast. Together, we're shedding light on all things related to abuse. So with that, let's listen into this replay of a TikTok Live. There's a lot of interesting biases about boundaries. What actually constitutes a boundary? Is it a masculine thing or a feminine thing? Why is this tension as if it is something that is almost like it's a hostile thing to those that is being experiencing the limits of it. It's interesting how boundaries has gotten controversial, so I thought we would talk about what boundaries are and how it relates to abusive relationships in particular, because it, it's a, something that is woven in and an integral part that is part and parcel. You can't really separate out abuse from boundaries because boundaries is, abusiveness is actually a severe infraction of a boundary. So let's start out with first just identifying what is a boundary. When we say that, what are we meaning? Because, you know, for the longest time, I really didn't get it. I, we don't talk about it a lot. There's not a lot of explanations. So let's start first with a definition of a boundary, and then we can move to how it, how it ties into abusive behavior. So when you, I must, by the way, let me introduce myself because that makes more sense to explain why I'm starting where I'm starting. I'm a clinical psychologist with over 20 years of counseling experience, and I primarily talk about narcissistic abuse, but I've had all this experience working with patients in the practice and working with all sorts of variety of issues through those 20 years where I saw private patients. I saw mostly adults, although I saw adolescents and I was trained to see children as well. What I notice is that, well, let me, but let's first go back to boundaries. What are boundaries? So when a baby is born, it doesn't have its sense of itself as a separate self. It sees itself, but I mean, literally, when it is being created, it is connected to the mother through the umbilical cord. So it is dependent. It is actually a parasitic relationship, a symbiotic relationship in which the baby needs the mother in order to, it's parasitic because the mother doesn't need the baby. Symbiotic would mean they depend on each other. It's a parasitic relationship. The mother doesn't depend on the baby for, for anything, but the baby uses the mother's resources in order to grow. And it is part of the mother and it sees it, it doesn't even see itself as separate. It just is part of this dyad, this two people situation. And then it's born and the cords cut. And the baby now, for the first time in its life, is actually separate. It's its own individual. But it doesn't have a sense of itself as separate because it is incredibly fragile. And it depends on the mother for, or the caretaker, whoever's taking care of it, for everything, for all its basic needs. It can't even roll over. It's completely dependent on the goodness, on the well-meaning of the parent. Very, very dependent. It still sees itself as something that is... um, part of the mother it sees still see or the the primary caretaker sees itself as not really separate it doesn't recognize separateness until about the time that you see separation anxiety appear you know when the baby's about maybe four five six months and the mother walks out of the room and the infant gets scared that's really what for the first time when the infant is aware that people can leave me i'm dependent on this person's goodness staying in my life to take care of me and they actually can abandon me. And that's a big, huge revelation. And there's like intense anxiety about that. And then it begins to realize that n- there are other people that just not mother, but although it's recognized father and other, maybe the siblings in the family, but it starts to recognize strangers from familiar. So there's the next big, big ex, you know, anxiety. 
And then as it, all of this is happening, one of the things it becomes aware of is that it has a sense that people can overwhelm itself, herself or himself, that people can be too close in their space. You know how you've seen adults get in the baby and like, you know, pinch his cheeks and they're right in their face and the baby kind of like recoils, has a sense of that there's too much intensity but also there is a sense of people like can walk out of the room and leave them crying or leave them hungry, leave them wet, all sorts of things like that. So there's a sense of engulfment that can be suffocated or overwhelmed. And it also can be that, that people can leave. And that's the first kind of experience of boundary, of boundariedness in the sense of overwhelming and loss or separation. And it just gets more sophisticated as we turn into adults and grow up. Our sense of who we are and people's in the relationship to us, it gets more sophisticated. We realize that we have a body and that people can intrude that body and touch it without our permission. Or we can keep everybody away and not let anyone have any contact with our body. But we also can do that with our feelings. We have an emotional self and we have a spiritual self. We have all these pieces and parts to ourselves that make up you and me. And these, each of these is a sort of a boundary. So what happens with relationships is that each of us have a set of needs and drives in order for us to move through life. We get hungry and we get tired. We want to be seen. We'd like to know that we are important and we'd like to know that people appreciate what we do. So we have awareness that our needs May even drive, you know, like I said, hunger and thirst and need to be safe. Those hungers, needs, drives, all of the maybe goals, dreams, all of that. And how do we get these needs met? Well, a lot of them have to do in a context of a relationship. We have to manage this in a group setting, in a community, in our society. Well, that's where it gets tricky. We can do it by requesting, but people don't always come through. We can try to negotiate, we can demand, we can, you know, there's all sorts of ways that we can connect in order to get our needs met. And yes, that's a really great question. Someone just asked, is that the start of an attachment disorder? Yes. When we begin to negotiate how we get our needs met, we are then beginning to do a sense of ourselves in the context of other people. And that's when uh, Bowlby and Ainsworth were observing infants with their primary caretaker. They noticed that some infants got really anxious when the mother left the room and other other infants seemed completely withdrawn and apathetic and others were very edgy and hypervigilant. They noticed there's this kind of this variety of display of how infants display their sense of safety, their sense of how they get their needs met in the context of the relationship. And it depends on how this dynamic between caretaker and infant occurs to how healthy. But there's also so many things that occur to us like some infants are hardwired with being very sensitive and overwhelmed easily. And other infants are bored and restless and need a lot of interactions. And so it's, it's also connection. So it's not always a failure problem. It could be just a, a, not a good connection between the caretakers and infants. But we begin to figure out how do we get our needs met. So this is where abuse comes in. Abuse comes in when we negotiate for our needs in a way that excludes the respect and care for the needs of those around us, that we don't appreciate that we're interacting with people who have a similar need as our own. We don't see them. We don't even see them. We're actually, in a way, blind to them being people who also have needs to us. Instead, we begin to see the world as sort of like a consumable, just a set of resources for us in order for us to get our needs met. What happens for those of us who don't have good, I would say that's somebody who is rig, rig, rigorously, yes, rigorously protecting their boundaries. That's what I would call that. But then there's some of us who are not protecting our boundaries well enough, where I would say we're too permeable, too fluid. And in, our, in those cases, we have learned that when we set boundaries, there's some form of rejection. It might be that we get ostracized or we get turned down or... It might be that it's nothing happens and we end up being dismissed or but some makes us feel ashamed. Something happens that creates a, a fear for us to sort of protect or set boundaries. Or maybe we just have been told that's what 
people shouldn't do. It's just wrong to do that. I've certainly seen that happen as well, where people live in situations where boundaries have been seen as as like inappropriate. I've seen sometimes in extremely religious settings that can be seen like that, that boundaries just are seen as as almost like a like a, an affront. You know, it's a, you, you can't do that. So for whatever reason, some of us have learned that we need to aggressively pursue our needs and we're rigorously protect our bounds, boundaries to the point that we neglect others and we see them almost as consumables. And then there are those of us who don't protect our boundaries enough because we've been somehow got the message that that to do so is is an overreach and is inappropriate. And there's where the toxic mix comes in for relationships in which for some of us, we get into these relationships in which we think we're being nice by being kind, by overextending, by giving when we're too tired, by by not asking for what we need, for all those types of things, we do that. And then others of us, we have such a fear of loss of control or fear of being intimate, being known, that we then protect ourselves by not getting close, by not dropping our guard, keeping everybody far and distant. I had never felt more alone during the years that I'd spent in the abusive relationship. Shame and fear cut me off from the rest of the world and made it difficult to share what was going on. Are you going through something similar? If so, then you're going to want to read my book, Love You More, The Harrowing Tales of Lies, Sex Addiction, and Double Cross. It's a true story of what happened to me. You'll discover that you're not alone and that you'll find out also what it took for me to finally escape. You can buy the book at all the major online stores or buy it directly from me and get a discount. For info on where to get your copy, please see the link in my bio. Now, I know what I did here is I did not really get into theory, and I kind of talked about this from more of a developmental standpoint, but how does attachment theory tie into boundaries? It kind of does loosely and kind of doesn't. So Attachment theory was actually based, like I said, on two people. It happened around, I think it was really around World War II was when it, where there were these observations. So, you know, we had these orphanages in Europe that were set up because all these, so many children ended up losing parents and they were warehoused in these big institutions with, they actually had good care. There were nurses and doctors there and they were attending to them, but the number of babies to caretakers was so, so overwhelming, the numbers were, that most babies weren't picked up or held, but they were fed and kept dry and kept changed. And what they found in these institutions were, was that there was a high rate of death. These babies weren't growing. They were losing weight. They, they, and when infection hit the institutions, they weren't able to overcome it despite the medications. And that's where you get the term failure to thrive. They noticed that infants who weren't, and interestingly, they noticed that infants that were the nurses' favorites that were picked up tended to be the ones who did better than the ones who were not picked up and cared for or weren't the favorites. And that's when they began to realize that huh, there's something connected to us needing to be in contact with another human that it does something for us nurturing-wise. It helps us even regulate us ourselves physically. And then they begin to realize that, that infants are very sophisticated right from the get-go, right from birth, and the ability to, to read the environment and know whether or not the environment is, is safe enough for them to explore, explore themselves, explore what's around them, and kind of a grow and all of that. So that's where attachment theory came out of it. But one of the things that people assume is because narcissists tend to struggle allowing people to know them. Um, I don't know how many of you got to see the interview with, I had with Ben Taylor, Raw Motivations, but he said being authentic, being vulnerable, sharing who he really is or was, hopefully he's getting better at it. For him, it's super scary because it's almost like a self-annihilation to allow someone in like that. Whereas most of us who've had safe experiences in our lives, enough of them, we find that being known and having someone see something really tender about us, something sensitive is actually a good experience. It's pleasant. It's kind of a wonderful feeling. But for those who've had, for whatever reasons, and I know it's easy for you to say, oh, it's because they've had traumatic past or over-controlling parents or 
yes, maybe that might be a part of it, but it also is genetically related. And all personality traits tend to run in families. For whatever reason, some of us find it more fearful, more more intimidating. But here's the part that I know we're going to get to is that we want to make sense of something that's highly complex. One of the problems we have in psychology is whenever you research something, there's so many variables that interplay and affect that you can't isolate one thing. There isn't one thing that causes narcissism. There isn't one thing that causes some of us to have problems with bounty. There isn't one thing that causes us to have attachment issues or avoidant issues or disorganized attachment style. There, there is a myriad of things that kind of come in and interplay that create these dynamics. Our best defense against this is to increase our self-awareness so that we can grow and understand who we are and make changes in the way that we relate so that we're constantly getting healthier. Let's circle back to this topic. So what does a really good boundary look like? Good boundaries look like our ability to request for what we need and want in the respect of other people at the same time. And that's hard work because sometimes we'll get what we need. Sometimes we have to delay it. Sometimes it's a blend of both. We have to find some form of compromise. So can I discuss infidelity in marriage? At this point, to this person says we're just living like roommates. So infidelity happens for a lot of complex reasons. I'm going to talk about infidelity now between two people who are not personality disorders. They don't, neither one of them have a personality disorder because I think when you add a personality disorder in, you've got a very different dynamic. So let's talk about it in a context of what was once a healthy marriage that somehow is now coming apart and infidelity is happening as a result of that. I'd be curious, by the way, the one who asked me this question, and I know I'm way down on messages, but who who is the one who is unfaithful? Was it you or was it your partner? I'd be kind of curious about that. Maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing that. I understand if you don't. It often happens when there's a disconnection between each other. Men tend to pursue it for different reasons than women do, but both of them are pursuing it for to get gratification that they're not finding in the relationship that they should be finding in the relationship. If you want to check out some great work on this, look at John Gottman's work, John and Julie Gottman of the jo Gottman Institute. They found that there are like a whole set of betrayals. The relationship starts to have difficulties, early, early signs. He says there's something like 20 to 24 signs that you're moving towards infidelity that are like slight betrayals that occur way before anybody ever steps out on the relationship. So it would be, you, you might find that interesting. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to look that up because that would be a, a great topic to talk about here is what are the early signs that we all may be at risk for infidelity in our marriage? So how can we keep ourselves healthy? But there, there's sort of a, a set of betraying of the connection and trust to each other that happens in very slight ways like not stepping stepping in for each other, not defending, like not responding to each other's needs. There's all sorts of things that sort of happen that end up are precursors to the actual breach. Interestingly enough, a lot of marriages make it through infidelity. You'd be surprised. It was a common problem when I was seeing clients. And I was surprised the number of clients who stuck it out and stuck together takes a lot of hard work. There's accountability ownership that the person who did the infidelity has to do to take to kind of create healing and safety back in the relationship. And then you have to repair whatever happened between the two people that resulted in the breach, why they emotionally stopped looking to each other. So yeah, it's amazing to me the number of people or number of relationships are able to withstand it. But the fact that you're saying you're living like roommates to me says that that's not happening, which I would express a lot of concern. I would really urge the two of you to get into counseling to look at those things. But let's talk about infidelity in the context of a narcissistic personality disorder and or an antisocial personality disorder, because that's a completely different thing. Um, what's happening there is individuals who are, are narcissistic or sociopathic, psychopathic is that they don't look to their partners for intimacy. As I said, everybody's a consumable. And as a result, sex is just one more way for them to meet their needs. So they don't see themselves as owing any allegiance to anyone. Their allegiance is always primarily to themselves. So it's to them, they see it as their right. They're entitled to this. In fact, I, I've even heard them say, you know, what my partner doesn't know, it won't hurt them. 
that's literally the blindness they have to these, to the context of it. So in that situation, to say that the partner is responsible for the breach in the marriage when they don't even know that they're in a relationship with someone who doesn't see themselves as really in a relationship or owes that kind of exclusivity to the partner is is wrong. We can't look at infidelity in the context of a that kind of a marriage in the same way that we would look at infidelity in another, in more of a healthy marriage. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. The comment to say it takes two to tango. Yes, that's a fair statement when we're talking about marriages who are just growing distant. But when you're talking about somebody who's in a narcissistically abusive relationship, to say it takes two to tango, that's that's inappropriate and you're victim blaming. It's a completely different mindset. Okay, so I'd like to know what you think of today's discussion. I'm going to go ahead and weigh in and give you my opinion. I think describing boundaries as masculine is another way to disempower women and that it's a dangerous suggestion, certainly not something I'd advocate for my children or grandchildren. It's this kind of exploitive thinking that puts all of us at risk, which reminds me, this is your last chance to get your ticket to the upcoming webinar, a live interview with Sandra L. Brown, author of Women Who Love Psychopaths. She'll cover other common ways women are manipulated into passivity and niceness. I'm so excited about this interview. Be sure to get your ticket today. The link is in the show notes. And if you can't make it, still buy a ticket because it will save you on the cost of the replay. The price of the video replay will be going up after the event concludes. So until Monday, I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.